weather warnings for Bali and the government to form tourism fund. Stay tuned for details. Selamat siang. Welcome to the latest news from Bali and Indonesia. This is December 6th, 2023, and we're getting close to the end of the year. Wow, this year has gone so quick and, well, much better than 2022, 2021, 2020. So that's something to be thankful about. And what about the weather today? It is a steamy 32.4 degrees Celsius here at 10 o'clock in Kampung Bugis. The humidity is 71% and the wind speed is 4.5 kilometers per hour. We got some rain yesterday, not much, about uh, 45 minutes here in Kampung Bugis, but I see watching videos around the island that there is some rain going on down in the south. And that is going to be one of the main stories for today. So let's get into it. In the next week, Bali will experience rain with light to heavy intensity. Bali Region 3 Center for Meteorology, Climatology and Geophysics, BBMKG, predicts that in the next week, most of Bali will experience rain. Yep, rainy season is here. Well, starting anyway. For the next week, the central part of Bali, such as Tabanan, Gyanyar, Badung, and the northern parts of Bali, such as Buling, Saririt, Sukasada, and Banjar, will experience quite constant light to heavy rain. Then, for the east, west, and south parts of Bali, there is still potential for uneven rain. However, it turns out that currently, the Bali province area is not yet 100% in the rainy season, and the peak of the rainy season is estimated to be next month, January 2024. According to BBMKG, we urge the public to always update information from us, especially regarding early warnings, in order to reduce risk of disaster that may occur. The public is also expected to get information from official sources in order to avoid provocation by hoax news. And there are a lot of hoaxes here in Bali and Indonesia, just like there are around the world. So you want to get your weather information, get it from the official source. And more on weather. Four regencies in Bali are prone to flash floods during the rainy season. Here is the list. So the Bali Disaster Management Agency, BPBD, stated that there are 17 sub-districts in four districts in Bali that have the potential for flash flood disasters. And where are these? Bulaleng, Karangasam, Klungkung, and Tabanan. Based on the forecast map of the potential areas for flash floods in Bali, this is for the period December 2023. The sub-district areas that have the potential for flash floods in Bulaleng, Banjar, Busungbiu, Grogak, and Suririt. Eight sub-districts in Karangasam, Abang, Burdamdem, Karangasam, Kubu, Mangas, Rendang, Salat, and Sidaman. And sub-districts in Klungkung, Dawan, Klungkung. And in Tabanan, Karambitan, Penebel, and East Slimading. Based on the forecast map of the Geological Agency of the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Resources, almost all areas of Bali have potential for landslides. There are eight districts in Bali that have potential for landslides that go from the medium to high category. According to Pak Renton from the agency, he said 39 villages or subdistricts were included in the category of high potential for landslides. Meanwhile, the potential for landslides to occur in moderate category, 324 villages spread around the island. For this reason, BPBD urges people who want to or are traveling to always pay attention to disaster warning signs in the area. And they appeal to the public not to leave the house during heavy rains accompanied by strong winds. Take care of your health. Also monitor the latest information regarding disasters on official websites such as BMKG, BNPB, BPBD. <laughs> and let's get on to the next main story. Government to form tourism fund to boost Indonesia's image. 
The president has instructed the tourism and creative economy minister, Pak Sandiaga Uno, who else, to form an Indonesian tourism fund. The purpose of this fund is to support the implementation of events, promote tourism, and improve Indonesia's image. Hmm. The agency, according to this, will be managed carefully and will choose quality international events to boost local and national economy. However, Pak Sandiaga said, well, we are not going to create a new agency. Rather, we're going to delegate the tourism fund to the educational fund management institution. Similar to the cultural fund, the tourism fund will involve relevant tourism stakeholders. So no new agency, right? Why create some more bureaucracy in an already heavily bureaucratic country? The government is targeting to manage two trillion rupiah for the first operational year. Pak Sandiaga also hoped that the presidential regulation concerning the tourism fund could be adopted this month to accelerate the implementation of this agency. Pak Sandiaga mentioned that the government projected tourism to contribute over 220 trillion rupees to the government. Tourism fund, he believed, will not be allotted for a new tourist destination. Rather, we're focusing on three things, nation branding, tourism promotion, and national international events. Pak Sandiaga said that the agency will propose several prime events such as MotoGP, F1, Powerboat, Aquabite, and Jet Ski Championship. They will be using this fund, and Pak Sandiaga said there will also be opportunity for traditional community events such as boat races and cultural events from Eastern Indonesia. So I was just reading an article yesterday about tourism in Thailand, and according to this article, 20% of the GDP in Thailand comes from tourism. I'd like to see the figures for Indonesia, how much of our GDP comes from tourism. And the government is really, really pushing tourism, but we've got a ways to go. Thailand does have some things that Indonesia does not have. For one, it tends to be a lot cleaner and the rules don't seem to change constantly. So there is a tourism fund that is going to be pushing big events and branding Indonesia. How are they gonna brand Indonesia? Is this kind of like the uh, Malaysia, truly Asia? We'll see what's gonna happen with that. But there's gonna be some money put into promoting tourism for 2024. And what is going on in Changu? Because what would a, a news report be without something about Changu? Sidewalk construction in Changu accelerated. The construction of sidewalks for pedestrians in Changu is being accelerated. Apart from beautifying the tourism area, the development is also intended to provide comfort for pedestrians. Wish we got our sidewalks fixed up here. Construction of the 1.3 kilometer long sidewalk starts from Jalampante Batu Midjan. Construction on the two sides of the road at once is going on and it's almost complete. Should be done by the end of the month. According to the implementer for roads and bridges of the highway sector of Badung PUPR, he said this project is a priority because the tourism area in Changu is not yet equipped for pedestrians. He said, with this in mind, it's hoping that this will encourage more people to walk in Changu. If they walk, it means they wouldn't be taking motorbikes and maybe the traffic would be better. But nice to have sidewalks. This is not, unfortunately, a walking friendly island. So right now, only about 350 meters of the sidewalk construction remains. And then it will be widening the asphalt and installing lights, finally. He said, if I'm not mistaken, 52 lights will be installed. And the lights weigh a lot, he said, but we have to install them. So with the lights on the sidewalk, light up the area, maybe that will cut down on the phone snatchers and purse grabbers that Changu seems to be plagued with. Nothing like making Bali safer for tourism and for locals as well. And it is hoped that in the future, the community will make best use of existing facilities. Don't use the sidewalk for parking vehicles. And if you've watched any of my videos of Singaraja snippets, downtown, <laughs> downtown Singaraja, Jalan Dipanagoro, 
You can't walk down the sidewalks usually. Zoe and I always walk down the street because there's motorbikes parked all over the sidewalks, everywhere here. Just not enough parking places, too many motorbikes, too many cars, too many trucks. And so we'll see what happens in Changu when people use these sidewalks as another place to park. So good news for you pedestrians in Changu. And here is something interesting. You know, in the past I've talked about the younger generation not wanting to follow in the footsteps of their fathers or mothers being fishermen or farmers. Well, Bululing has the largest number of millennial farmers in Bali aged eight, 19 to 39 years. 15,634 millennials are still farming. The Bali Province Central Statistics Agency, BPS, released the data on the number of millennial farmers just recently based on the regulation of the Minister of Agriculture of the Republic of Indonesia, number 4, 2019, concerning guidelines for agricultural human resources development, movement towards the World Food Platform 2045. Millennial farmers are aged 19 to 39 and are adaptive to technology, digital technology. The digital technology in question includes the use of modern agricultural tools and machineries, the use of internet or information technology, smartphones, drones, and artificial intelligence. Wow. Based on the government statistics, there were 54,908 millennial farmers aged 19 to 39 in Bali 160,175 farmers who are over 39 years and use digital technology are 44%. And 27% of the farmers who are less than 19 years old and use digital technology, 0.007%. This is the new data that has been collected following the conditions of 2013 to 2023. So there's still a lot of farmers in Bali. The district or city with the most millennial farmers is Bulaang Regency with 28%. Meanwhile, the Regencies with the second and third highest numbers, Karangasam and Bangli. Karangasam has 22.72% and Bangli 16.74%. Meanwhile, the rest, Tabanan 4,758 people, Jambrana 5,702, Gyanyar, 2,844, Klungkung, 2,032, Badung, 1945, and Dempasar, only 325 people. What is clear is that millennial farmers are raising farmers from upstream to downstream, inviting farmers not to let go of their land, and they're also building glamping apart from farming, and they get a bonus from renting out these accommodations. Glamping. And so... Still got farmers around. Good news. Of course, the land is reducing, reducing, reducing the agricultural land as we build more and more lovely hotels and villas because we really need more hotels and villas in Bali. And what about some traveling? Jakarta Denpasar and Singapore Denpasar are predicted to be the busiest flight routes during Christmas 2023. The Director General of Air Transportation, Ministry of Transportation, has prepared a number of steps to ensure that the series of air transportation activities for Christmas and New Year's this year run well, safely, and smoothly. The number of passengers for the Christmas period is predicted to be around 4 million, or 19% higher, than last year during the same period. This prediction shows that the recovery rate for air transport passengers is approaching Christmas of 2029, namely 84.6% for domestic and 93.5% for international. Hmm. It's predicted that the potential for busiest routes will be Jakarta to Denpasar, Makassar, Medan, and Surabaya routes. Meanwhile, the busiest international routes, Jakarta to Singapore, Denpasar to Singapore. Based on the results of a survey by the Transportation Policy Agency, the peak of homecoming traffic and air transport is going to happen in two periods, Christmas 22nd of December and peak on New Year's on 29th. And the peak of the Christmas and New Year return flow will happen on January 2nd, a mass exodus from Bali. Hmm. Maybe things will calm down a bit here. And let's wrap it up 
with something from an Indonesian anthropologist. I love Indonesian anthropologists. You want to hear what people say about their own culture, what anthropologists say about their own culture. And a professor of legal anthropology says, young voters must connect with history. Professor of legal anthropology at the University of Indonesia. Professor Irianto said that in the general election, the Indonesian people must be able to document historical narratives from the generation to generation. According to her, the younger generation as young voters must be aware of the track records of potential leaders. I'm not sure if she's alluding to somebody and I'm not gonna get into that because, well, that could be some sticky business there, but um, I know what she means, or I think I know what she means. I don't know, and if you've followed Indonesian politics over the last 30 years, you can probably guess what she means. The professor observed that young voters tend to be presented with gimmicks rather than in-depth knowledge of the track records of candidate pairs. So the younger generation must be able to connect directly with events that occurred decades ago, she said. The current and future generations must not be without a knowledge of history. Indonesia must become, she said, a country that's able to maintain democracy and law with historical knowledge. The professor believes that democracy can be on the edge of a cliff if what is presented is gimmicks rather than knowledge about figures who support democratic intelligence. The democratic parties must be carried out in acceptable ways. Our nation must fight for democracy and law, she said. And that seems to be a theme going around the world these days, trying to keep democracy in countries where it is under attack. And just thinking about this, we go back, let's say, three decades, not even necessary to go back as far as three decades, but let's say three decades. I know a number of Indonesian, young Indonesians whose knowledge of that period is not a whole lot. And so hopefully they will be looking at the candidates for the upcoming election carefully, as the professor said. And that is it for today. Thanks for viewing. Be kind to someone today. Stay safe and have a great week. Sampa Jumpa.